our precious few tourists, which of course we all love. Um, so tonight's format, uh, I am going to talk to you a little bit about my history with the Silk Road and then the history of the Silk Road uh, before I'm going to hand over to my colleague Mark, who is the head of uh, the director of product and operations at Wild Frontiers. And we're going to kind of bounce between the two of us as we uh, run, a, run along a route from China heading eastwards towards the Caspian Sea and a little bit beyond explaining about the various countries on that route. Um, we are going to use uh, group tour itineraries to show you those routes, uh, but please bear in mind that we operate as a 50-50 company. 50% 50 of what we do is groups and 50% of what we do is tailor-made. So if you'd like to do any of these trips, but you'd rather do it on a private basis or you want to do some other form of private trip, then of course we can organize that for you as well. I should also mention that running for July, we have a £25 deposit scheme for both groups and tailor-made to make uh, bookings for you as easy as possible or as, as, as stress-free as possible. And amazing, oh, I say amazingly, uh, very luckily for us, there are a lot of people booking up. In this week alone, we've had four bookings for the Great Silk Road Adventure, which is a 46-day epic, which I shall talk a little bit more at the end. But without further ado, we've got a lot to get through. It's a big region. So let me crack on now. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got started on the Silk Road. So uh, here we go. Yeah, back in the 90s, I um, had some big adventures. I rode a motorbike right the way around Africa. This gave rise to my first book, which was called Running with the Moon. It did perhaps better than was expected. And the publisher said to me, do you want to go and do another one? And I thought, of course I do. And I knew in an instance what I wanted to do. I wanted to follow in the footsteps of my heroes from English literature, Peachy Carnahan and Daniel Dravet from Roger Kipling's short story, The Man Who Would Be King, as they traveled from India up through Pakistan into Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush. So I grew a beard, donned a turban and headed off into the Hindu Kush. This gave uh, rise to my second book for a pagan song um, and also Wild Frontiers as I, that's where I kind of had the idea for setting up the travel company. But travel writing wasn't finished with me yet and I think most poignantly for this particular webinar my next journey uh, was on horse along the Silk Road. I traveled overland from Islamabad up the Karakoram Highway over the Kunjarab Pass to Kashgar like thousands of traders and, and, and travelers before me, where I bought a horse and traveled the length of the Silk Road to the Caspian Sea. That gave rise to my third book, Silk Dreams Troubled Road, uh, and also a Discovery Channel film. And so to illustrate uh, this, I'm just going to show you a little clip from that, uh, that TV program. Um, just bear in mind, when we put these videos on Zoom, they are a little bit juddery, but I think you'll hopefully get the general gist of it. The Yashamba Bazaar, the Kashgar Sunday Market. Same today as it's been for a thousand years or more, since the heyday of the Silk Road. And here you can buy anything and everything from fruit and veg to ironware, woodwork, donkeys, mules, and of course horses. We've come here today to buy, hopefully, to buy two horses to help get us out of China and into Kyrgyzstan. But it's not any old horses we're after. We want horses descended from heaven. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, what a comfortable saddle. This is all padded. How weird. Never like hog manes. I don't think it's exactly descended from any heavenly horse, but... Probably straight from it, actually. Only 2,000 miles to go. We're going to be the first Westerners to have crossed this part by horse for a very long time. We're wild and free in Kyrgyzstan. This is mare's milk. Is it vodka? <laughs> we made it. Well, 
Well, goodness, um, there you can see uh, my journey along the Silk Road. It took about five months, uh, was uh, extremely incident packed, but what it really showed me was what an extraordinary area this was. And as soon as I set up Wild Frontiers uh, in 2002, for real, um, I set up trips in this part of the world. And indeed a trip through Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan was the first tour that we actually ran outside of Pakistan where we officially started. Um, so I hope that what we do over the course of the next uh, little while is tempt you and, and with our passion show you just how much we love this part of the world and hopefully pass that on to you so you'll be compelled to travel there. So a little bit of the history. Um, the Silk Road itself, the term was first coined by Ferdinand von Richthofen, who happened to be the uncle of the Red Baron by the same famous name. Um, in, 90, sorry, in 1877, he called it uh, Seidenstrasse, which of course means Silk Road. I think it's probably fair to say that the term had already been used, but he's the one that's kind of accredited uh, with it. Um, and it's something of a misnomer because of course, as you can see from this map, it wasn't just one road, it was multiple routes that traveled from uh, east to west or west to east, from Xi'an all the way uh, across to Europe. And, on that route, there were some major crossroads, such as Kashgar, where you've just seen me buying my horse, where routes would come up, uh, not just going east-west, but also heading south and north. South, of course, down into uh, South Asia and, and, and the Indian subcontinent. Um, what was the fuss about? Well, this silk, um, the silkworm cocoon. Um, legend has it that a Chinese princess was sitting under her mulberry tree one day drinking tea when one of these cocoons fell into the tea. She put her fingers in to pull it out and it all came out in lots of lovely threads. And she thought, aha, maybe I can dry that and spin it. And that's what they did. And for 500 years, the Chinese had silk to themselves. And indeed, it wasn't really silk that drove the trade along the Silk Road. On the contrary, it was actually more to do with horses. Um, this is what they would have done. They would have spun it, they would weave it into this beautiful cloth that we have today. But the horses of the Silk Road were the really important element of it. Back in about 128 BC, uh, Han Modai, this is of the Han Dynasty, Han Modai was having his armies uh, massacred on the Western frontier by a group of Turkic people called the White Hun. And the main reason for that was because they had far superior horses. This particular horse in this photograph is called an Akaltek, which is the horses of Turkmenistan. And the horses of this region, the Fagana Valley region and Turkmenistan, were famed for being uh, so tall. They were well over 16 or 17 hands. They were fast. They had incredible endurance and they were much stronger. And therefore, obviously, they gave the uh, White Hun a massive advantage over the Chinese emperor's armies who just had these small Mongolian steppe ponies. So in 128 BC, Han Wadai sent an emissary, a chap called uh, Ching Quain, to go and try and get, procure some of these horses, which after a 10 year odyssey, which saw him captured by the uh, White Hun and a number of other adventures, he managed to do, trading some silk for them and bringing the horses back. And that in a very roundabout way was the opening up of the Silk Road. Of course, it then traveled from Xi'an over the mountains and deserts of Central Asia uh, to the, uh, the markets of Byzantium um, and Rome and, uh, and Venice as, as the kind of the journey went all the way through to Europe. Um, places became so wealthy from the, from the trade that great emporiums sprung up. Uh, the tra goods traveling in both directions, coming from the east, there was silk, there was porcelain, there was paper, tea, spices, medicinal herbs, citrus fruits, perfume, and the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and going in the opposite direction, so that's from west to east, uh, was gold, silver, ivory, jade, wool, horses, Mediterranean colored glass, cucumbers, walnut, grapes, and of course wine. Um, and these, this trade started to build up so much that um, these, these towns along the route became wealthy on trade. Great emporiums were springing up. This is where the agents, the contract makers, uh, the money lenders, as well as publicans, blacksmiths, merchants of all sorts, the Silk Road's middlemen became rich on trade. Samarkand, Bukhara and Kiva were the halfway points where traders from Baghdad, Herat, met merchants from Tehran and Kashgar. 
Bukhara became so wealthy from this trade that it had 365 mosques, one for every day of the year. But of course, it wasn't only trade that was moving along the Silk Road. Wherever you get humans traveling, you get thoughts, ideas, religions, etc. Before the beginning of, before the uh, arrival of Islam in the seventh and eighth centuries, you had a plethora of different religions. The main one was Zoroastrianism, but you also had Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shamanism. Um, and I, I put this photograph in because you also had fashion moving down the Silk Road. These are two photographs I took a few years apart. Uh, on the left, you can see a Kalash girl in northern Pakistan, and on the right, you can see a Ladakhi woman uh, from up in the Karakoram range. They live some five, six, seven hundred miles apart across some of the most um, uh, difficult to traverse terrain in the world, and yet you can see the similarities between their headdresses and their clothing. The, the, um, the, the turquoise on the Ladakh lady's hat uh, and the cowrie shells on the Kalash lady's um, headgear. So tra trade was moving across, but so were ideas and thoughts and, and religions as well. Caravans rarely traveled the entire length of the Silk Road. If they did, it was said to take 240 days. Um, mostly they would take goods a certain section, they would trade goods there, they would pick up and buy other goods and take them back again. And so goods would work their way along the Silk Road. Um, and it was all going swimmingly until this chap happened along, Genghis Khan, who uh, the 13th century yellow peril, soldiers of the Antichrist come to reap the last dreadful harvest as one 13th century commentator put it. Um, Genghis Khan was renowned for, for, for battering towns um, in a very big way when he came upon them. And indeed, many towns never recovered. The likes of Merv, where he put apparently a million people to the sword, and Balkh in Afghanistan were both huge conurbations which never recovered after the Silk Road. And indeed, after Genghis Khan, it, it really started to spell the demise of this trade. Uh, the Silk Road did have something of a renaissance during the time of Emperor Timur. Uh, I'll talk more about him when we're talking about Uzbekistan, but he obviously had a huge empire um, and, and from those empires brought artisans that made the great Samarkand as it is today. Um, but the end of the Silk Road really was the opening up of the sea routes in the 15th and 16th century. Traveling the length of the Silk Road in these caravans was, of course, an incredibly dangerous, hazardous operation. There were many marauding tribes that would fall down on the caravans and, and steal the goods and take the, uh, the, the, the travelers away as slaves. Uh, it also took a very long time, so goods became expensive. With the sea routes opening up, it was much faster, it was much safer, and therefore it was much more lucrative. And the Silk Road really dwindled out completely. Um, the final kind of absolute boom, Iron Curtain, was when Sino-Soviet relations fell apart in the 1950s, and that really was the closing of the border. And you saw that little clip of me walking underneath that triumphal arch, um, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. That was crossing the border between China and, uh, and, and what was then the USSR, and very few people would have done that for a long time. So that was the closing of the Silk Road. Interestingly, though, now, it is having something of a renaissance under the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative, which is looking to spend an extraordinary $4 trillion opening up the trade routes again to get Chinese goods to market that much quicker. This is overland routes, as you can see on this map, but also sea routes as well, as the Chinese try to uh, get their goods to market all the quicker. If you're interested in this part of the world, which I imagine you are as you're watching this <laughs> webinar, this is the one book that I would recommend you read. I don't know Peter Frankopan, and he's not giving me a kickback for this, but this book is absolutely brilliant. I've read it twice. Um, it, 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 the, the Silk Road's A New History of the World. Interestingly, it's not just about the Silk Road that we're talking about. It spans the whole kind of demise of the Eastern powers, the rise of the Western powers with the Industrial Revolution, and according to Peter, uh, how we are all starting to demise again over in the West and the East is rising. Um, it talks about the Spanish conquests of, La of uh, Latin America as well. Fascinating book. He's also, I'm halfway through his new book, which is more about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and China's um, perceived geopolitics 
ambitions. So that's a book that I strongly recommend you to read before you travel out into this part of the world. There are others that I will also recommend in a minute. But now, having quickly whipped through the history of the Silk Road, uh, what was that, kind of 2,000 years in about five minutes, I am going to hand over to Mark, who's going to take you through the Chinese element. And in order to do that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mark can share his. Over to you, Mark. Okay, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Hopefully, I can take you through China. So, to introduce you through the Chinese section of the Silk Road, I'm going to use one of our trips, which is an 18-day trip called the Chinese Silk Road Taklamakan Adventure. And this follows very closely the main eastern branch of the Silk Road from Xi'an over in the east, right the way over to Kashgar in the west. And if you look at that route, you'll see that from Xi'an, you get to a town called Lanjiao, that's on the Yellow River. It then goes through an area. Now, if you look between Lanjiao and um, Jiayuguan, if you look just to the south of where the route is, you'll see the Tibetan Plateau. And if you look just to the north, you'll see the Gobi Desert. And that area, that route that it goes through is called the Gansu Corridor. Corridor, it's a very, very narrow strip of land that even in the old Silk Road days um, followed that path. And even today, trains, roads, and our trip follows the same route because geographically, obviously none of that has changed. And it goes on, you'll then see the Taklamakan um, Desert over on the western side, and finally Kashgar. So following that route, here are some of the things that you may see if you travel along. So it starts in Xi'an. You might ask why Xi'an, not Beijing? Well, Beijing has always been an important city, but it's a fairly modern capital. And from a Silk Road perspective, Xi'an is of much greater importance. Um, and even today, Xi'an is still this incredibly impressive city. Back in the day, it once vied with Roman Constantinople for, for greatness. But even today, you will still see 14 kilometers worth of roads, um, sorry, walls, which go around the whole city and gives you a really good vantage point out over the place. But I think the main reason why people come to Xi'an is for this, the Terracotta Army. Dates back over 2000 years, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, probably one of the most iconic places in the entire world. But what not too many people know is it was actually only discovered in 1974 completely by accident. A peasant was digging in his garden for a well and came up with some bits of pottery, handed them into the local museum. We went, not sure what that is, dug a little bit of a bigger hole, and this is what they found. And what is incredible is there was no writing about it whatsoever. No one knew it existed. It wasn't like people had been searching for it. And they even say that today, this is still just a fraction of what exists out there. And again, it gives you an indication of the wealth and the artistry um, that existed during the kind of golden era of the Silk Road. Anyway, leaving Xi'an and heading westwards, you will come to Lanzhou on the Yellow River. Yellow River, the second largest river in China, the sixth largest in the world. And here you'll find places like the Binglisi Caves with their beautiful grottos. And you'll also find the Lebrang Monastery. Um, which sits right at the edge of the Tibetan plateau, almost at 3,000 meters. And again, gives you an idea of the different cultures and the different peoples that the whole routes would have gone through. Then you're going to go through, no choice, the Gansu Corridor, Tibetan plateau to the south, Gobi Desert to the north. And finally, as you go along, you will start to see vestiges of this. Now, if I tell you that this is the Great Wall of China, you might go, that's not what I think of the Great Wall of China. Well, just as Johnny showed you that the Silk Road wasn't just one road, so the Great Wall wasn't just one wall. There are actually lots of different walls built at very different periods throughout China's history to defend itself from the barbarians of the north. And in this part of the country, you will find the wall looking a little bit like this, rather than the perhaps better known parts of the Great Wall that you'll find like this um, nearer to Beijing. But in any case, as you get to the western edge of the Gansu Corridor, you also get to the end of the Great Wall. And this is a place called Jiayuguan. Now what China used to do, um, rather than putting people in prison or rather than executing people, they would bring people here, they would open up the big gates and they would exile them outside of cultured China into the wastelands beyond. 
and it was very harsh lands and most people never survived. This is the route that we take um, and you'll find iconic places like the Crescent Moon Lake in Dunhuang as well as the World Heritage Site of the Mogao Grottoes which are truly, truly breathtaking. You'll also find lesser known sites. This is a place called Jiahe which was a 14th century Silk Road garrison town that was destroyed, another one by Genghis Khan. And then you get to the Taklamakan Desert. Now, none of the routes went through the Taklamakan Desert. It is a vicious desert. So people would choose they'd either go around the north or they'd go around the south. But either way, both the north and the southern routes would meet up at their western edge in Kashgar. And Kashgar, back then as today, really is this crossroads town for lots of different cultures. And if you, if you look at these faces, you'll see people look different. And that's because ethnically, they are different. Although it's part of China um, today, ethnically, the people here are not Han Chinese, they're Turkic, um, they belong to Central Asia. The language that they speak is Turkic, which means people from Istanbul can come here and speak with people in their local language, Uyghur, and be understood. And food-wise, it's different. You'll find here more kebabs, uh, flatbreads, you'll find little dumplings, much more like Central Asia. And architecture-wise, it's different. This is the Abu Khoja Mausoleum, and you'll start to see some of the tiled architecture that you may associate more with Central Asia. Um, it's also home, as Johnny was saying earlier, to the famous Sunday market in Kashgar, which is really a great place for meeting Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and the people from all over Central Asia. If you've got any hair, which I think neither Johnny nor I have these days, it is a great place to have a haircut. And you can also buy your horse here, as Johnny did back in the day. Now, before I hand back to Johnny to take you westwards on the journey that he took and the route that we're taking you today, it is worth re-emphasizing that Kashgar really is this crossroads and that there were trade routes that not only went east-west, but also went north-south. And you can go from Kashgar southwards into the Indian subcontinent. Unfortunately, the pass into India, the Karakoram Pass, is closed to tourists, it's only for pilgrims. Um, but the pass into Pakistan, the Kundra Pass, is very much open. And that is the pass that we take on probably one of our most epic journeys, the Karakoram Adventure. And this takes you over the Karakoram Highway, over the Kundra Pass, through four different mountain ranges, the Karakoram, the Hindu Kush, the Pamir, and the Himalaya, down into Pakistan proper, over the border into India, to Amritsar, the Sikh homeland, and finally to the Mughal summer capital of Srinagar. And it really is a, a stunning journey for those of you that really want to take, I would say, probably one of the most amazing road journeys the world has to offer. But I'm going to hand you back to Johnny, back to Kashgar, to take you westwards. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Whoops, we're still on. Who's our Frankopan, who we can move through. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, so Kyrgyzstan. Um, the simple thing to think about Kyrgyzstan is mountains. Um, it is the most mountainous country in the region, if not one of the most mountainous countries in the world. 94% of the country is mountainous, with only 7% capable of arable production around Bishkek and the uh, Chui Valley. Um, it is 80% of it is over 1500 meters, 40% is over 3000 meters, and a third of the country is permanently covered by snow. It's also the land of nomads. Um, the Central Asian peoples, of which there are six, are loosely made up of three nomadic tribes and three sedentary tribes. The nomadic tribes are the Kyrgyz, the Kazakhs, and the Turkmen, while the, the Uyghurs, the, um, the Tajiks, and the Uzbeks are more of the sedentary people, the, the, the great traders of the Silk Road. And that's what you get in Kyrgyzstan, um, is this wonderful mixture of, of the, 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 the nomadic culture and the wonderful mountain landscapes. Um, the trip I'm going to kind of roughly take you around is our Kyrgyzstan Explorer, 15 days, and really opens up the entire country for you. Ha heading first of all out of Bishkek to the uh, east and then kind of coming back around by Tashrabat and, and the um, walnut forest of Aslanbok uh, to Osh and the uh, Sirichi Lake uh, National Park. So 
most trips to, Bish uh, to Kyrgyzstan will start in Bishkek. Now, the, the Central Asians are no strangers to calling their capital cities uh, strange names. Um, Almaty, which was the former capital of Kazakhstan, means father of apples. Dushanbe, uh, the capital of Tajikistan, means Monday. Uh, Tashkent is rock place. Uh, Ashgabad is city of love. Uh, and Bishkek, somewhat bizarrely, is named after one of these a milk churn which is used to make butter. Um, I don't know why, but there we are. It's actually a really beautiful city in its own way. Of course, like a lot of these former Soviet cities, it has a lot of the kind of Soviet architecture and tenement blocks and that sort of thing. But it also is beautifully set, um, backdrop by the Tin Shan Mountains, which are always have a snowy background. Um, it's wide leafy streets, it's cafe culture. It's a really nice place to hang out for uh, a day or two as you kind of catch your breath after what was probably a fairly long journey coming over from Europe or America uh, or wherever you've come from. Um, from here, we head, as I say, uh, east out towards uh, Lake Isikul. And the first place we'll stop at is the Barana Tower, the ninth century Barana Tower, which was um, part of the um, Balashagun uh, Empire, it's about the last of the, uh, the sites that you can see here. There was a whole town around this particular tower. Um, the tower itself was used as a, uh, as a lighthouse. They would put a fire on the top so that the caravans coming from Kashgar, you can see the mountains behind. If you go over those mountains, as I did on my horse, you will come to Kashgar. So the, 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 the uh, travelers could see the fire and they would be, uh, follow the direction to come to where the town was and where they could replenish their supplies, etc. From here, you travel on to Lake Isikul, which is one of the biggest in, inland water lakes in the world. It's actually um, the th 113 miles long and 40 miles wide. It's the 10th largest lake in the world. And at 1600 meters above sea level, the second highest uh, mountain lake behind Lake Titicaca in South America. It's also saline, so it never freezes. It's always Quite warm and I've swum in it on many occasions. If you look closely at the bottom of the screen you can see some yurts and um, as, as tourism has grown in Kyrgyzstan over the last 20 years so there's been a rise of people putting these wonderful yurt camps up which, which make great places to stay right on the edge of Lake Isikul. Um, we drive around that and we stay in Bukhambayava with the eagle hunters. This is a major pastime in both Kyrgyzstan and Mongolia and Kazakhstan. Uh, the locals, they love it. They dress up in their finery and they have these fabulous eagles that they demonstrate their skills with. Um, there's also some great walking. Obviously, you're up in the mountains. Why not um, take advantage of that? And some of the treks you can do over some of these mountain passes, this is called the Ton Pirival, which takes you from Lake Isikul into the Narin Valley, where you can pick up a beautiful route down um, towards Lake Songkul. As I say, a lot of what you do in Kyrgyzstan is about the nomadic culture. You will stay in yurts, you will stay with families, many of whom are our friends. We've known them for years. They've helped us develop our, our trips here um, and learn about the nomadic way of life. You saw me in that clip right at the beginning, um, drinking mare's milk. Um, it's kind of fermented mare's milk. It's a bit fizzy. It's a little bit alcoholic. A lot of people don't like it on their first taste of it, I acquired quite a liking for it. And it, rather like they do with the vodka in shot glasses, you have to drink your kumis, as it's called, in a big gulp. Um, but they're making cheese up there. They, they travel up, even though under Stalin, what happened was, you know, Stalin didn't like nomads. He didn't like people moving around. So he tried to force them into a kind of sedentary life. And to some extent, it worked. They have villages, they have winter homes, which they go and live in. But during the summer, they pack all their things up and they travel up into the mountains to, um, to, to, to go back to their roots, if you like, where they make their, their cheeses and their butters and stuff and, and their milk and they live that more nomadic life. One of the most spectacular places on this particular route is Tashrabat, which kind of literally means rock motel. Um, back in the old days, in the Silk Road days, the caravanserais were, were split up about every three days apart so that the caravans traveling uh, could replenish their stocks, could get their horses shoes seen to, could, could meet blacksmiths, could have a drink, could meet other travelers. Uh, and Tasharabat, as you can see, set in this beautiful setting. 
uh, an amazing building in itself with uh, incredible arches, which was from the 11th century, um, was one such place. And there would have been a calm there and people would come and stay the night and then move on. I, myself, rode over from Kashgar. It took me three days. I got to Tashrabat and stayed the night there where I traded my horse from Kashgar because he was a bit of an old Dobbin um, and got a better horse and carried on on my journey. But this is a beautiful place to stay. Again, Nazira and her family look after us. We've known these guys for years. She helped me with my horse 20 odd years ago. Uh, and so we stay in the yurts there and again, get this great uh, kind of life of the nomad. Before heading up to Songkul, this is one of the jewels in the Kyrgyz uh, tourist crown. It's an amazing high lake, uh, 3,000 meters above sea level, about 40 kilometers long and 18 kilometers wide. And again, during the summer, the nomads come up here. You can see on the backs of these camels the yurts which they bring up. Uh, there's one kind of Blue Peter style, one put up and one down. It takes about four hours to put one up and two hours to take one to pieces, and they still take them up. I mean, often they take them up now these days in trucks and things, but they do still use their camels uh, to take the, uh, the, the yurts up there. And then they stay for five months up here with their animals, uh, breeding them and, and milking them, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the savvy ones have put up a couple of yurt camps for us travelers as we want to stay there. Stunning place. Um, the yurt itself is a, very much a symbol of Kyrgyz unity. One of the things that, of course, the Central Asian states had to do when they were all granted independence or when they all took independence in 1991 was find some sort of symbolism to create their national identity around. Um, and with the Uzbeks, it was Tamerlane. Um, with the Kyrgyz, it was the yurt. And they used the tunduk, the central part of the yurt, to represent the country of people together. With this tunduk, the round circular piece of wood, everything else is held up. Without it, there is no unity and the country collapses. And it's even in the Kyrgyz flag, as you can see here. We stay in the yurts. Um, they, are, they have improved quite a bit in those 20 years. Um, you, you often get beds. In the old days, you just sleep on a yak fur rug. But nowadays, you get beds, and they even have the odd shower and loose. Um, and it's really good fun. This is where, um, of course, you can do this on a private tailor-made basis, but it's also really good fun in a group with the locals looking after you, and they tell you stories, which your guide translates, and have a lot of fun up there. And you can go horse riding and walking, um, et cetera. Um, and as you can see, just stunning landscapes. They also love to have a game of what's called Kokboro, which is very similar to the Afghan game of Buskashi, which is kind of fighting for the carcass of a dead goat um, and on horseback, pretty rough game, um, but interesting cultural experience to watch. But it is worth noting that Songkul at 3000 meters, um, you are quite likely to get uh, four seasons in a day. This photograph I remember well was taken on the 2nd of September. So an early snowfall, uh, it didn't last long, the sun came out and it was gone by 11 o'clock, but it, it, it gave you an idea. But as you can see here, Norgul, um, our host is actually uh, stoking up the fire to make sure it's warm enough for the people that are inside sleeping. Um, from here, we head around heading further to the west um, this is uh, Sarichi Lake National Park, where you can see the landscapes become more alpine. You get alpine forests before heading down in towards the Fagana Valley and Aslanbot, which is where they have walnut forests. And here, and, and indeed in a, in a lot of Kyrgyzstan, we're staying with community-based tourism projects. People, in, in, as we get into the more kind of urban areas in, in, ta in their houses, in homestays, uh, if not up in the yurts. But this gives a great opportunity to interact with the Kyrgyz people uh, to understand their ways, etc. Um, before we come down to the town of Osh. Osh is a 3,000 year old town and this is where the kind of fallout really of Stalin and his divide and rule plans kind of comes into, uh, you, you see it very clearly here. Osh is, a, is an Uzbek populated town. 80% of the residents of Osh are Uzbek, but it is in Kyrgyzstan. And that was um, Stalin, as I say, dividing up the people so they couldn't form a kind of pan-Islamic movement on, their, on, on the Soviet um, uh, eastern border. Um, it's a fascinating place, 3,000 years old, as I say, 
Um, it has a great market um, where you can go around and, and see the Kyrgyz, but, but generally, as I say, you will see more Uzbeks here than Kyrgyz. Um, so that's Kyrgyzstan in a nutshell. Um, right now, I will hand back to Mark, who will take you through Kazakhstan, I think it's next, Mark, yeah? Yep. Okay, so... Ah, oh, one sec. So, yes, no guesses for knowing who this gentleman is, Kazakhstan. Now, when I was in my early 20s, I used to teach English as a foreign language in London, and I remember on my very first day, I had a girl in my class, and she was from Kazakhstan. And I remember saying to her, ooh, Kazakhstan, I don't really know where that is. Where is it? And she said to me, go look at a map tonight. And I did. And I remember going home, looking at a map, and seeing this, and being incredibly embarrassed. But I just don't think I'd ever seen Kazakhstan before. It is the ninth largest country in the world. It is larger than all the other stars put together. Um, and yet it seems to occupy this incredible gap in our, in our knowledge. Um, in order to take you through Kazakhstan, we're not gonna explore the entire country being so huge. Mainly what we do on this trip across the Kazakh steppe is we focus in on the southern part of the country. And if you look, you'll see the routing pretty much hugs the border with Kyrgyzstan. Um, and this takes it closest to the Silk Road routing. Um, it is a gas-rich country. Um, oil you'll find also in the west as well, um, sitting on the Caspian Sea. So there is quite a lot of wealth there. There's quite a lot of foreigners there as well, again, because of the um, gas. So it's, it's bizarrely cosmopolitan in, in, a, in a very Kazakh way. Um, this is the cultural capital, Almaty. Um, as Johnny was saying, Father of Apples is its name. Um, it was renowned for the apple orchards that used to um, surround the city. And in the backdrop, you can see that's the Tian Shan Mountains that you'll also find over in Kyrgyzstan. And it's a really nice city. It's very pleasant. You've got places like this, the Zemkov Cathedral, um, which is one of the world's highest wooden buildings, uh, not a single nail used in its construction. But we head out from here, out towards the east, to this beautiful national park called Altin ML, which is more desert-like in its appearance. You can see here with the coloured rocks and with the singing sands and the famous Charon Canyon, which the, the locals almost refer to as their kind of mini Grand Canyon. But very nearby here as well, you've got some quite contrasting scenery, more alpine features with the Kultsai Lake and with the iconic Kandy Lake, which was formed after an earthquake and that water, that turquoise water, is not photoshopped. Um, it was caused after an earthquake in 1911, and those spruce trees still continue to grow despite being partly submerged. So beautiful, beautiful scenery. This is to the east of Almaty. If you head to the west of Almaty, which we do, um, you'll start to see um, places like this. These are burial mounds, um, which were discovered. And this particular one was discovered in 1969, and it was excavated, and inside, this is what they found. It's called the Golden Man. And this really changed the way that a lot of people started to think about this part of Central Asia. This dates back two and a half thousand years and people just hadn't really acknowledged that this part of Central Asia had such a rich culture at that time. And for those of you that know Sutton Hu and the way that that dramatically made people rethink uh, kind of the dark ages of England, this did the same for um, Central Asia. And it's quite a stunning sight to go and see. As you head further and further towards the east along the Silk Road, you'll find some really old cities, many of them in ruins, but still quite striking. This is Sauron and Otra. Um, and you'll also start to find some things which Johnny will show you more of when you get to Uzbekistan, which is some of the Islamic architecture which you'll find in Central Asia, including this mausoleum, which is a 14th century World Heritage Site. And then finally in Kazakhstan, because it is such a big country with such great diversity, we do spend a couple of days in the bizarre capital, um, which is a new capital. Um, it used to be called Astana. It was recently renamed Nur Sultan. And because of the money that the country has, it's a little bit like Dubai, um, where they just throw money at architects and just say, look, just do something wild and wacky. So you will find these stunningly bizarre buildings right in the middle of the capital city, in almost the middle of the steppe lands. Um, 
and including this one, which is the, the Temple of Peace and Harmony. So Kazakhstan, huge country, but a really nice mixture between culture, silk road builders and stunning scenery. And before I hand you back to Johnny, I am going to take you through one more star, probably the least well known of all the stars out there. It's Tajikistan. Now Tajikistan is 90% mountains. Um, it is um, a beautiful country. And the route that I'm going to take you through really follows a route through the mountains on a road called the Pamir Highway, which was built by the Soviets. And it takes you through that entire eastern half of that road is in the mountains. The Pamirs means high um, valleys. Um, and alongside the Karakoram Highway, it is considered one of the world's most amazing and beautiful drives. Now, Tajikistan did suffer a pretty nasty civil war after independence in the 90s, and you will still sometimes see vestiges of this as you travel throughout the country. But what's really fascinating about Tajikistan in comparison with the other stars is the people here are ethnically different. The Uyghurs, the Kazakhs, the Kyrgyz, the Uzbek, the Turkmen, they're all Turkic. They all speak this language that can be understood in Istanbul. The Tajiks don't. The Tajiks are related to the Persians. Their language, Tajik, is related to Farsi, and they look different here, and it is a different culture, and they look much more to Iran and the Persian culture. And scenically, it's very different. It's much more akin with northern India and northern Pakistan, rather than the steppe lands that you'll find further to the north in Central Asia. And you will find some culture there in the capital, Dushanbe. Um, you will find some interesting monuments. You'll find some fortresses. You'll find some museums with some um, uh, monuments from the Silk Road. And they have a, a lovely monument at the time that Tom Selleck visited the country in the 1970s, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, but really, that's not the reason why people go to Tajikistan. They go there really for the scenery. And one of the reasons why I really like this photograph is if you look on the left, that's the Pamir Highway. That's one of the main roads through the country. In the middle is the Amdaria River, which in antiquity was known as the Oxus. And on the right hand side, that's Afghanistan. And it's quite amazing to be driving along the Pamir Highway, looking out over bridges into little uh, over bridges into little villages in Afghanistan. And this is a very peaceful part of Afghanistan, but it is quite a fascinating place to go and see. And as you get further into the Pamirs, this is an area known as the Wakhan Corridor. And it's a narrow strip of land that now divides Tajikistan from Pakistan. And it's occupied partly by Afghanistan. But more importantly, back in the 19th century, this was the divider between the Russian Empire and the British Empire. And Britain was paranoid that Russia was going to invade the, the jewel of the, of the crown, India, through this region. So there's loads of subterfuge of meetings and people trying to gain control of this region. And where these people are, they're standing in Tajikistan with the Pamirs behind them, looking out over a tributary of the Oxus, over into Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush in Pakistan beyond. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And there are yurts here, like you'll find in Kyrgyzstan, um, where again, you can meet the people, you can try mare's milk, you can see how people live, but not so much. It's much more about staying in community-based tourism projects like this one, which is a guest house, which gives you, again, a different type of interaction with people where you can eat with them, you can cook with them, um, and offers a very different experience from what you'll find in Kyrgyzstan. Um, for those of you that do actually want to go into Afghanistan, it is possible. There is a little border. If you look at the map, you'll see in the middle a little town called Ishishim. That is a border crossing into the Wakhan Corridor. And it's just worth noting that that part of Afghanistan was never taken by the Taliban. It's always been peaceful. And when you meet the people there, they're called the Wacky people. They speak a language very similar to Tajiks. The women there are not veiled. They wear these bright red colors. And it's incredibly poor, but a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place to go and visit for those of you that are intrigued by Afghanistan, which is a stunning country. But as before, I will hand you back to Johnny, who are going to continue our journey through the stars. Johnny. Thank you, Mark. Hang on a minute. Let me just do that and that. Do. So I always like asking this, uh, what is the only landlocked country landlocked by landlocked countries? And the answer is, 
Uzbekistan, that's of course leaving aside Liechtenstein, which is really just a principality. Um, Uzbekistan, it, if, if you think of the wilderness being Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and particularly Tajikistan, then in Uzbekistan is where you get the culture. This, this is where you get really the most extraordinary architecture, world-class architecture, as good as any you're likely to see anywhere. Um, and it really is the most remarkable place, all uh, renovated really well and, and very easy to, to enjoy. Um, the trip I'm gonna quickly talk about is the Land of Silk Road Treasures, which is our Uzbek only trip. Um, but we do do another trip which combines Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, which I think Mark's going to talk about. Um, loosely speaking, uh, Tashkent, round to Samarkand, Bukhara, and up to Kiva, which are the three main parts of, or the three main cultural sites of Uzbekistan. Of course, Uzbekistan, their national hero is Emperor Timur, Tamerlane. Um, to the Uzbeks, he's an absolute hero. To the rest of the world, he was kind of uh, the despot's despot. Self-proclaimed descendant of Genghis Khan and the great-great-grandfather of the first emperor mogul, uh, Babur. Uh, in the second half of the 14th century, he had a huge empire that stretched all the way from Delhi in the east to Hungary in the west. Uh, his uh, conquests and brutality are legendary. It said he put 100,000 people to the sword in Delhi. Uh, the he built pyramids of skulls and fired heads from cannons in Turkey, if you believe all that. He actually died on campaign in China in 1405, but not before he had gathered together many of, the, of his uh, empire's great artisans and brought them together to build Samarkand, which really is one of the great cultural sites of the world. Center of the universe, mirror of the world, garden of the soul, jewel of the east, pearl of Islam. It's had writers and, and poets waxing lyrical uh, for millennia and for good reason. Um, at its heart is the Registan, which is the public square where people gather for proclamations and place of public execution. It's uh, framed by three madrasas from this photograph, it may look like they're identical. They're not. The theory was that only God could create perfection. Therefore, man had to make it slightly off center, which is what they do. But it's a remarkable place today where you can uh, wander around and there are some little stalls inside, but it, it's really one of the, probably one of the greatest ar architectural sites I've ever seen. There is Emperor Timur's mausoleum, which is uh, a pretty spectacular place and Shari Zindar, which is the famous necropolis in the northeast of the city, where many of the uh, Tamarid Empire's um, courtiers and, and uh, noblemen are, are buried. And there is also the Bibi Kainum Mosque, which was built by Emperor Timur between 1895 to 19, uh, sorry, to 1401, I think, um, for his wife, um, uh, just before he went off on campaign to China and died, but it's a, a huge mausoleum. At the time, really, really pushed what was possible with architecture and parts of it didn't last, parts of it did fall down. Um, from Samarkand, oh, but I should say, sorry, that we also have fabulous markets in Samarkand. This is where you'll see some of these extraordinary breads that get made um, and the Uzbek culture of the marketplace, which is a very exciting place to go and look around. From here, we head on to Bukhara, which is my favorite town in the region. Um, the reason why I love it is it's just so laid back. I, I was lucky enough on my horse riding trip to spend about a week here uh, trying to deal with horse issues, but it, it's a wonderful place to just potter around. There are lovely little town squares where, which have a tank in the middle, a water tank and little restaurants and you can sit and, and eat your kebabs and drink your beer and stuff. But the sites um, are what you're really there for. And of course, this is the most famous one, the Kalan Minaret. It was said that Nazarullah Khan, who was the uh, head of uh, who was the Amir of uh, Bukhara back in the mid 19th century, uh, would use this tower to execute his foes. He would take them up to the top, stitch them into a Hessian sack and push them off the edge. Whether that's true or not, again, not sure. Um, but the, it's surrounded by the Kalan Madrasa um, and the Kalan Mosque, which is uh, in the kind of forefront of it. Stunning sites. One of the other main sites is the Ark. This was the citadel of the Amir. And it was here, Mark was alluding to the great game when he was talking about the, um, the, the, the Tsarist Russian and 
Britain's imperial power and paranoia that the Russians were going to try and invade uh, Af uh, India through the northern route. Um, Connolly and Stoddard were two British soldiers that went off to Bukhara to try and befriend Nasrullah Khan. He didn't really like them. He stuck them in a pit and brought them out and eventually executed them. It's an extraordinary story. I said that I'd mention a couple of other books as we go through. Uh, Peter Hopkirk's series on The Great Game is absolutely riveting. And in fact, it was, that was one of the reasons why I got into this area so much. Can't recommend this book enough if you want to read about this 19th century war of attrition between the British and the Russians for control of Central Asia. Fascinating story. It also has great markets um, there, which are loosely these days, of course, for tourists, um, where they make the silk. Uh, and uh, you can see silk production being made. I'm going to show a little video right at the end of that. Um, there are markets, there are musicians, there are uh, artisans. It, it's a fun, lively place where you can uh, really get the heart of the Uzbek soul. You will also, interestingly enough, hear Tajik spoken here quite a lot because, uh, again, with Stalin's divide and rule, Tajikistan is actually very close by. So you get Tajiks that were trapped here uh, during the kind of breakup of it. And again, you will meet families and uh, not necessarily stay with families because there are some really lovely boutique hotels, but go to dinner with families and see how the Uzbeks live compared to that say the Kyrgyz, that the sedentary people. These, the Uzbeks were the traders of the Silk Roads. These were the guys that were the money men. They were the ones that kind of built the trade of the Silk Road while the Kyrgyz and the Kazakhs were with the camels taking the goods to and fro. Um, and finally, in, in, on this kind of route, you come to Kiva, which was another of the great carnates of Central Asia in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, it's become, it's a walled city. It is still lived in, in parts of, and you can see artisans that live there. It's a, a stunning place, largely now a kind of living museum, but as I say, there are people that live there. Um, and you stay in some of the old caravanserais. Um, I took this photograph early one morning, just as the sweeper was out doing his business. It's not all about architecture and urban ancient culture in Uzbekistan. The Narata Mountains are beautiful and we do take people up into these to stay in yurts and meet the local people up there just as a kind of contrast. And then of course you have the Aral Sea, that um, ecological disaster that took place between the 1960s to kind of present day. In the 1960s you can see here 68,000 square kilometers down to 7,000 square kilometers in 2009. This was really because the monoculture that was driving irrigation to irrigate the uh, cotton fields of Uzbekistan and was a huge, as I say, ecological disaster. Um, that's Uzbekistan. Uh, hand over to Mark now, who's going to quickly go through Turkmenistan before we answer some questions. Mark, over to you. Finally, so Turkmenistan is absolutely the oddest of the stans, without a shadow of a doubt. And one of the reasons for that is this gentleman that you're looking at here, Niazov, is a rather eccentric chap who took over um, as an absolutely autocratic leader when independence came. He renamed um, days of the week after himself. He renamed the word for bread after his mother. Um, and I'll show you some other weird things about him in a set. Um, Turkmenistan lies just to the south of Uzbekistan. Um, it's gas rich, um, but as Johnny said, we usually visit it in conjunction with Uzbekistan and it provides a really nice contrast. And this is one of our most popular trips called Cities of the Silk Road, which effectively spends about a week or so in Uzbekistan and about a week in Turkmenistan. And the two countries are rather different. Um, so here he is again, Niazov, in the capital Ashgabat. He did like statues of himself. He had this complete personality cult um, that was built about him. And if you look at that tower, if you look at the very top, you will see that there is a statue of him which starts off facing east in the morning. And then as the sun rotates to the south, it rotates with it right the way around to the west throughout the whole day. It really is something out of a science fiction novel, but no, this is the capital city of Turkmenistan. Monuments all over the place. It's this bizarre mixture, a little bit like Pyongyang meets Las Vegas. People love it or hate it, but they will always remember it. Um, but from a Silk Road perspective, one of the main sites um, that people come to Turkmenistan to see is Merv. Now, as you may remember, Johnny said earlier, this was the city where Genghis Khan is said to have put a million people 
to the sword in Merv. It was one of the most important cities on the Silk Road, and it was said to be the second most important Islamic city after Baghdad. It was huge. Um, today, it is in ruins but it's quite spectacular um, in its remoteness and you can explore it. And it's something you can pretty much have this ancient city almost always to yourself. And there are other places around the country like Konya Agench, um, which has got some um, ancient buildings. Um, but as you'll see, it's in a very different state from Uzbekistan. It gets far few uh, visitors and it's for people that like their sites a little bit uh, less polished, I would say. But it's not just the, the, the sites that you can see, uh, the cultural sites. You've also got some bizarre um, natural sites. This is the Darvaza gas crater. Um, and it's often one of those sites that you'll see on the, you know, 100 weird places to go and see before you die. Um, we usually spend the night camping around this and seeing it at night, which is quite an amazing um, thing to go and see and do. And for those of you who want to explore a little bit further, if you head right to the very west of the country, you'll get to the Yangi Kala Canyon. And if you look just into the distance, you will see what was the end of Johnny's journey when he did his horse, which is the Caspian Sea. And I will hand you back to Johnny for the final section where he'll give you options of what you can do next. Oops. Uh, thanks, Mark. Do, do, do. Ba, ba, boom. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, following on from basically the end of Central Asia, obviously there are routes that will continue because the Silk Road didn't stop at the Caspian Sea. Um, ferries that take you across very difficult to kind of coordinate as I found to my peril. Um, but the best routes through are obviously through Iran where you can just travel overland through Iran into either the Caucasus with Georgia and Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, or indeed travel straight from Iran into Turkey and head on your way to Istanbul. Now the trips that we've been talking about so far have been loosely speaking single country trips to illustrate the routes through the particular country that we've been talking about. But what a lot of people like to do for obvious reasons is take multi-country trips through this area. So I'm just going to quickly talk through that. Now this route, loosely speaking, follows the trip that I did by horse. We set this up as a pretty much identical trip to the one that I did by horse, albeit slightly different roads. Um, it starts in Bishkek and travels down to Tashrabat and then goes over the Torogot Pass to Kashgar, comes back over the Urkishtan Pass into Kyrgyzstan, travels through Tajikistan into Uzbekistan and finishes in Kiva before flying back to Tashkent. That's a 23 day trip through four countries and it runs every July and August. Another one is if you want to tick off all five stans is the five stans of Central Asia that starts in Almaty in Kazakhstan and does a, a loop through all of the countries uh, before finishing off again in Kiva and heading back to um, to, to Tashkent. This is 29 days, five countries and runs in June and October. But if you've got the time, then this is the one that I recommend, the Great Silk Road Adventure, Xi'an to Istanbul. It's 48 days, six countries, 12,000 miles, 15 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and it runs in May and September. Now, the one thing that people say about this trip and, and it, it, it surprises me how popular it is because obviously it's quite a long time to be on the road. But people say that by doing this trip in one go, they really get a total sense of the journey of the Silk Road. And I kind of understand that myself having done this journey by horse. You really, by doing it in one continuous route, you, you really see the different cultures, the different peoples, the different architectures and landscapes that the old travelers back in the day would have experienced. So if you've got the time, that is the trip to do. And uh, as I say, we had four bookings on this in this week alone. So it's obviously proving popular. Um, so just quickly before we go to questions, uh, we have this special offer on for July, which is £25 deposits or $32, depending on where you're booking from. And that's on all group and tailor-made adventures. So do please bear that in mind. And we also have our COVID promise. So this gives you maximum flexibility depending on how things are looking with the uh, corona pandemic next year. But we're hoping that with a 25 pound deposit, you're not risking too much. So do get on and sign up. So Mike, have we got uh, some questions? 
you need to put your, your muted mic. Thank you, Johnny. Yes, uh, that's great. Thanks very much, Johnny and Mark. We've had quite a few questions come in during that talk. So um, I'll take them from the top. The first one from Peter. He wants to know how close you get to the terracotta warriors in Xi'an. Mark, I'll let you answer that. Um, you, there are viewing platforms. You, um, on, on our group tours, you, you're basically doing your, your standard viewing. So you get close and there are ones that they've taken out from the main area. So you can actually see them up close. But in order to get access um, to the actual trench, that's something which has to be done on a tailor-made basis. That's a real VIP thing, which can always be guaranteed, but it has to be requested in advance. So depending on how big your interest is, but you get them to see close enough um, in the museum section of it. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, Julie would like to know how vegetarians would cope on a Silk Road trip. I have had quite a few vegetarians on trips and <laughs> there are situations where which vegetarians won't like too much when you have to eat the Kyrgyz national dish called Bishpermak, which means five fingers and basically it's a goat boiled in a cauldron. That said, um, tourism in Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan it's no problem, there's, 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 um, there's plenty of vegetarian food, but in Kyrgyzstan um, Tourism has increased and improved tremendously over the last decade and uh, people that provide tourists with their accommodation are very aware of vegetarians and, and deal with it accordingly. Fantastic salads. Um, you probably will eat quite a lot of pasta uh, and rice, tomato sauces, these kind of things. Don't expect to have a culinary, um, you know, a wonderful culinary adventure, but you, you can certainly be, um, be, be looked after well. Great. Um, Alison Telfer wants to know whether the, the wonderful gold tomb goods that, that Mark talked about in Kazakhstan, can they be seen in any museum? Um, I've actually done some Googling on this, Mark, if you don't know the answer. And um, I found out the Golden Man has been on a world tour last year. He visited Beijing, Athens, Moscow and Malaysia, but he's now back in Kazakhstan. So um, all being well, um, he should be back in the National Museum in their nurse also. The next question is um, probably one for Mark. This is from Anna. Um, are there any of the borders between Northwest China and the Eastern stands open to solo tourist travelers? And if so, how easy are they to cross? Yes, you, yeah, you can. You can be a solo traveler. It, uh, we have taken people um, solo. It just, if I'm honest, it's just quite expensive because what you often find is vehicles can't cross the border so you'll have to pay for a vehicle to get you up to the border and then you'll have to arrange for a vehicle to meet you the other side so we can obviously arrange all that but it does mean that as a solo traveler it does add a little bit to the price so what sometimes people do is certain sections of trips they if they're not grouped or people they will at least maybe do those sections as groups and then maybe go solo again so it can sometimes be done that way um, so possible, but as an independent traveller, very, very difficult because there's almost no public transport. Great. Um, another question from Anna is, is it possible to visit the Baikonur, the um, Space Centre in Kazakhstan as a tourist in a similar way you can visit the Kennedy Space Centre in Florida? Yes, it can. We have arranged it for people. Um, there used to be a hotel there that interestingly, only had single rooms because it was only for cosmonauts and people training to go there. So it was quite weird when we had couples going there, they would actually have to have a room each. They have now built additional accommodation for visitors. Um, it again isn't cheap um, because it's quite limited and it's quite awkward to get to, but it can be done. Um, you usually need, if you're adding it on to our Kazakh trip, you can usually do it as an extra three days or so, usually with one flight and one overnight train. Um, but trying to link it in with an actual launch, that is incredibly hard because knowing the dates in advance, uh, it's usually very hard to pin them down. But to actually go, you can get a tour around um, the Space Center. So yeah, it is still a fascinating place to go and visit. Great. Um, a question from Alice, can the China and Pakistan or, or Silk Road and Pakistan tours be combined? 
Over to you, Mark. <laughs> yes, let me think. They can in theory, if the date, I'm not sure if the dates work. Uh, one of the things to bear in mind is it's such a complex part of the world to organize trips. Not only are you dealing with different climates and passes that only open at certain times of the year, certain passes are only open on certain days of the week, and then throw into that mix religious festivals, national holidays. So I'm often quite limited as to when I can schedule the trip. So I would say in the theory, no problem whatsoever. In practice, not sure. Give us, get in touch, um, and we'll have a look to see if any of the trips combine. Most likely, it would be in the autumn um, because you can't get over the um, Kundura Pass until a little bit later on in the year. Great, thank you, Mark. Sarah would like to, she would love to do the long Silk Road adventure, but her husband is a bit worried about her safety in Iran, particularly uh, as a woman. How safe is Iran at the moment? Ah, oh, goodness. I, I, I was there last year. It's no problem at all. Um, we've taken hundreds and hundreds of people to Iran, women. Um, I, I usually get asked this question by Americans and I give the same answer. On the last group I took there, I had three Americans. It was largely made up of women uh, and it's no problem at all. One thing you have to kind of bear in mind with Iran is that the people of Iran are incredibly kind of Western looking, Western focused, um, have a very open cultural mind and understand that, uh, you know, politics and governments are one thing, but people are another. Um, and, and as I say, we run multiple trips to Iran um, for uh, women and men, and, and it's, it's no problem. It's an incredibly interesting, beautiful country to visit, and you get absolutely lauded by the locals all the time. Great, thank you. Um, Anita and um, Hilary have both asked um, what's possibly the elephant in the room question, which is related to the the Uyghur people in Western China um, and how that affects our trips, if at all? Well, it's always difficult. I mean, the simple answer to that is it doesn't affect our trips because we don't go anywhere near these, um, the, 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 these centers. Um, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer insofar as these kind of um, ethical issues come up across quite a few different locations and it's often hard to know where you know wh whether you should go or not go and i think we as an organization have always run uh, an apolitical business we don't really get involved in that there have been a couple of exceptions but generally speaking we put on the trips and we are uh, advised by our local suppliers who are in the case of kashgar they are Uyghur people we that that's who we use to to, to run our trips they want us to come we want to go um, and, and therefore we set it up. And therefore I think it's really down to individuals to work out whether or not they feel that it's the kind of place they want to go to. Um, so these are kind of personal questions that I think individual travelers have to ask themselves. Okay. And Sarah wants to know whether there's any dress rule for, for women, um, particularly in the stands. Any no, dress not really. Um, I mean, bear in mind that there is still an awful lot of um, Russian, people that have lived, Russian, uh, ethnic Russians that live in the stands. Um, I think you do have to be kind of culturally sensitive, but you don't have to wear any veils or anything like that or, or long, uh, you know, long dresses. Um, no, so uh, it, it, it's, it's just a matter of really what you feel comfortable in, but I don't think you'd really wear kind of hot pants and a, and, and, and a, 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 what do you call it, a halter neck, but at the same time, um, you can wear t-shirts and, and uh, you know, long shorts and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Eleanor would like to know what the level of accommodation is like um, on the Silk Road in general. Well, in general, it's hard to say because it varies pretty radically. So in Kyrgyzstan, you're staying in yurts, um, which vary in their kind of luxury uh, levels. Um, fairly basic, to be perfectly honest. In Tajikistan, it's often homestays, which is staying in Tajik people's homes. Uh, in Uzbekistan, it can be very good, very nice boutique hotels. In fact, 
over the your shoulder, Mike, there in Bukhara, just near, is the Kalan, <laughs> the Kalan uh, Boutique Hotel, which is absolutely gorgeous and has a beautiful view of the tower. So uh, very varied. Um, and you have to kind of slightly take the rough with the smooth when you're going on a journey down the entire Silk Road. But we as a company always try to get you the, the best and most interesting accommodation. Okay, and obviously we have um, a trip that takes in the full length of the Silk Road and there's a couple of questions there. One is, um, can, can the full Silk Road trip be done without going through Iran? And the second question is, how many visas are needed for the 48 day full Silk Road trip? Uh, Mark, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'll take that one. So, um, if you don't want to go through Iran, and we have had people that want to go through Iran, um, but um, for various political affiliations or sometimes for reasons unknown to us, but the client wasn't particularly surprised, were denied a visa, we have um, rooted people um, away from Iran. The problem is, is that Turkmenistan is a little bit of a dead end. You've either crossing the Caspian Sea, which as Johnny knows to, um, um, we can tell you about one day, that literally involves going to the port city of Turkmenbashi, waiting for three days for a cargo ship that might take you and then maybe getting across. It's just not really a viable option. Then going up through uh, Kazakhstan and Russia is just not really an option. So realistically, if you don't want to go through Iran, you have to fly. Um, now there used to be a really nice direct flight from Ashgabat across the Caspian Sea to Baku in Azerbaijan, and you could carry on through the Caucasus into Turkey that way. Unfortunately, last year, um, bizarrely Lufthansa operated that flight. They canceled it. We were hoping for it to be resurrected. At the moment, it hasn't been. So basically, you can do it, but you would probably have to fly by Dubai or Istanbul onto the Caucasus to continue that journey that way. So it is doable, um, but you just have to put a, a bit of a flight in there to continue your journey. And with regards to visas, it really varies um, on where you're coming from. But as a general rule, Iran is the one, unless you happen to be Australian or Irish, in which case it's really easy, but for Brits, Canadians and Americans, it usually takes about two to three months um, for the whole visa process. So that's usually when we start. For Brits, Kyrgyzstan is visa free. Uzbekistan is now visa free. Um, what else we've got? China is fairly um, easy and standard. You can usually get that in a few days. Um, Turkey is just an e-visa. Tajikistan is just an e-visa. So it's really just Iran, which is the one that takes a little bit more time. So it's, it's easier than it used to be uh, and getting easier um, each year. And just bear in mind, you don't have to give your passport up for those three months. No. You only give your passport up right at the end. No, no, no. What, what happens, you give us some details, we send them on, it all gets applied for, then you get a visa code back, then you go to the embassy and you get your visa. Thank you, Mark. Kirsten would like to know when the best time of year to visit the Silk Road is. Well, the issue that you have with visiting the Silk Road is you have so many climatic conditions. So it all depends on which part of the Silk Road you want to go on. And indeed, our Great Silk Road adventure runs in the spring and the autumn because that is the time where you will get through the mountains and it won't be blisteringly hot in the cities. Um, so really the answer to that is yes, the spring and the autumn. But if, you're going to, if you just want to do the Kyrgyzstan Explorer, that's great right in the middle of the summer, July and August. Um, if you just want to do the Cities of the Silk Road, that's probably best in October or April and May. So it, it's, it's really just around the climatic conditions of either mountains or plains. Thanks, Johnny. Um, the second elephant in the room, I guess you could say, is um, how has coronavirus affected um, Central Asian countries? Well, I haven't kept up with the latest figures, but I know that they've been, certainly Uzbekistan has been very strict on lockdowns, uh, as has Kyrgyzstan, um, and the numbers are therefore relatively low. Um, if I'm being honest, I think it's unlikely we will run any trips to Central Asia this year. I think we're really looking now to book up next year. And therefore, you know, a lot of our bookings have gone from 2020 to 2021. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's really, we're looking at 2021 now. And I would hope very much that they'll all be back up and running and full speed by then. Great. Um, and Helen would like to know whether any of our tours visit the, um, the shipwrecked, rusting ships on the um, Aral Sea. 
They don't at the moment. Um, it's very easy to organize as an extension is how, is how we do that, because we, we know people do want to do that. Um, and we have organized it for people. It's a, it, it's a day excursion from Nikos. I think that's right, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, you have to spend an overnight there. It's too far to go in one day. So yeah, there's a town called Nukus, which is just beyond Kiva, um, which has actually got one of the best avant-garde Russian art museums in the world and people love it. So you stay in Nukus, you then drive out in four wheel drives out to the edge of the Aral Sea. You'll spend the night camping there. It's the, there is now they've got a little bit of a fixed camp there, but it's quite basic and then you come back the next day. So it's really a kind of a two day excursion from Nukus. Thanks very much. I think that's, uh, that's it for the questions, Johnny. Thank you. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna share my screen once more. Um, let me just have a quick, I can't remember if I go straight into this. Uh, I know. Oh yes, of course. So just to quickly tell you that the next webinar is on the 29th of July. That's, as Mike said at the beginning, Oman, Lebanon, and Jordan. And Mike, Mark and I will be joined by uh, Paul uh, Klamer for that. He wrote The Lonely Planet Guide to Jordan. So that should be good. Do sign up for that. And now, just as a kind of out way, way of kind of finishing off, I'm going to give you a little video on silk production. But before I do, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see still so many people there. Sorry it's gone on a bit. It is a big subject. Um, so thank you so much. We hope that we've inspired you to travel the Silk Road as all those many people have done before you. Thank you very much. Good evening.